large enterprise that I can think of in my lifetime in this country has been through as many logos and as many regime changes as BT. I mean, you go back to what doesn't feel like that ancient a history of 1979 when it was part of the GPO. Um, and you can actually forget all the changes in regime. You know, the, there was privatization, managed competition with Mercury. Does anybody remember Mercury and the Mercury button on a few phones? Uh, internationalization, uh, constant communications and the failed merger with MCI. Does anybody remember any of that now? That's like late 1990s. Um, turbulence in the domestic market, extraordinary turbulence in the domestic market. Cable TV, the winnowing out of the zillion cable TV companies to the eventual uh, single virgin media. The opening up of the last mile services uh, and the creation of uh, open reach. Uh, the mobile revolution, extraordinary from thinking of Cellnet, BT Cellnet. O2, no to O2, sell, sell, net and O2, uh, then buying EE. Um, and the technology has obviously changed enormously from the old System X, which was the, uh, the BT or the GPO's digital switching system on which they spent uh, billions. Um, well, Gavin Patterson became chief executive of uh, BT uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, he was an interesting choice because he was a marketing, a marketing man BT had had technology people, it had had visionaries, Ben uh, Verhen, it had had uh, finance guys, Ian Livingston, your predecessor, was a finance guy. Uh, and the interesting thing is it hasn't done too badly under, under Gavin Patterson. <laughs> I was actually looking up the share price. Um, I think it's up 40% since you took over. FTSE has stayed still. Vodafone has stayed still. Sky has gone up about 20%. Uh, you've probably knocked 20% off Sky, where Sky would have been if you hadn't come along. Um, so it's been a very interesting few years and a very interesting few decades. We will have a chat up here. I will then open to questions. Um, just to say them asking, and as a warm-up question for you, Gavin, Brexit, where do you stand? <laughs> Thank you. Brexit. Uh, we're inners. Uh, I think the terminology is, Evan. Um, now, we believe the, the company is best served uh, by the UK being part of the single market. Uh, and we've had that position for a long time. And the, and the reason for it is very simple. Uh, we're an international business. We serve customers in 170 markets. Uh, the vast majority of the business overseas uh, is in Europe. Um, and... You know, it's easier to do business when there's a single set of regulations and that we're inside the debate trying to influence things as opposed to trying to operate in those markets being on the outside. So we'll be in these markets regardless. Of course. But we believe it is better to try and lead and ensure that it's a, uh, you know, it's a commercial and liberal debate. It's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Because one of the big issues, is this may not become a kind of big debating point in the popular debate, but an important issue is the issue of Britain's trade agreements, and in particular the issue of services, of which you are one. Now, John Kay wrote a rather interesting piece in the FT this week, saying, by the way, the EU hasn't really got a single market in services at all, and actually, if we'd wanted to negotiate anything, maybe services would have been quite a good thing to negotiate, quite apart from talking about what happens when we come out. I mean, what... What would be your, what would you want? I mean, have you got what you want in single market terms or have you? There are, I mean, broadly, yes. Um, it's, you know, by and large, uh, the EU is, is not a, a limitation in terms of how we do, how we right. do business. There are, I'm sure, things you know, ultimately that could be done yep. better as there are in any organisation. But it's, you know, generally it takes a long-term view um, it removes tariffs, um, it acts as uh, or gets critical mass in terms of negotiations with, with other regions around the world. These are things that are important. Um, we, we're net beneficiaries in terms of uh, investment in R&D, which is critical to a business like ours. We, we spend half a, half a billion a year, 500 million a year on R&D alone. And, and, and 
you know, being in the U EU, I think, allows us to get a lot more right. bang and, for our buck out of that. And if we came out, and that clearly one of the, again, part of a big part of the issue about it, if we came out, we would have a discussion with the rest of the European Union about the new trading terms. And it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how, you know, what assertions are made over the next three months about that Brexit scenario and what the, that negotiation would be. But if the EU was so minded and said, we're very happy to sign Britain an agreement, a trade agreement in goods, most notably because we, the EU, sell you lots of goods. We're very happy to sign one in goods, but hey, actually we don't much like your law firms in your city, and so we, we're, we're gonna take five or 10 years to think about services. Would that be a potential threat to BT, or do you treat that as a kind of? It, it, it would be, it would make life difficult for us, and um, uh, it's, there's no question about that. So that wouldn't be a, a good outcome to, right. for us. Right. Uh, and I don't think it'd be a good outcome for the UK as a whole. Right. Okay, let's talk about um, BT uh, rather than Brexit. Um, I, I suppose one of the questions looking at the company these days is, is what does the group add? What is quite a mix of different businesses? What mm. do you think the, the, the what, what do you think the, <coughs> The sum, what the sum, why the the sum bigger than the, the, the parts? Uh, it's interesting when you were sort of going through the history of BT. The way we look at it is its history goes back to the uh, the 1850s. Actually, it's the oldest telegraph company in the world, and um, a lot of the the innovations and inventions um, that have marked the development of, of communications and broadcast around the world are inventions that have come out of the company. For many years, it was a division of the post office, um, and it was only separated in, in the 1970s, and then obviously privatized in um, well, 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago now. So, uh, but it, its history goes back to 1850, um, something like that. Uh, and the reason I mention that is that it's, its heart, it's a network business. That's really what it, we, we build and run networks. Uh, and it was true in the 1800s, and it's exactly true today. And any time we move too far away from that, uh, we tend to go through one of those out-of-body experiences <laughs> that you were describing in, in the introduction. Uh, so BTTV, so the, the heart of it is BTTV, I mean, you could call it a network, it's a television network, but it isn't really. It's a content provider. That's a, it's quite a long way from the core network a, skills that you're describing. When the... When the telephone was first invented, nobody thought it would be any use. Okay? They had very niche applications. So do you know what the network was first used for? For distributing uh, audio signals from theatres in London to people around, uh, um, around the, the, the provinces uh, around London. Uh, and it was only the radio that changed that. So if you go into the, uh, the history of the company... Uh, you can see how it was used before it became really used right, as a telegraph. Right, origina but the originators didn't say, so what we're going to do is open a chain of theatres to provide the content to push down our phone lines to people at home. But, but that is what you're doing now. And I, I no, mean, we're not. What we're doing is using content to drive usage of our network. That is the strategy. So the, the, the way to think about the business is the investment in, in the network is... Billions of pounds. Yeah. Okay. So we've just invested three billion pounds, uh, but it's largely a fixed cost. The marginal costs of adding more and more customers are relatively small. Right. So there's a there's a real benefit from going from 25% you know, take up of, of superfast broadband to 30% take up, and the key to that is to find new ways for for people to to use the network. What better way than video? And in video, the thing, more than anything else, that people want to watch uh, real-time is sport. So that, that's how the strategy works. Right, but, 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 sorry, I can get BT Sport on Sky, can't I? You can. So but you get a better price if you get it on BT. <laughs> but, I mean, you could put Sky Sport through your cable. I mean, I, I, I understand why you want to... Well, exactly. So in what sense are you adding customers by creating... BT Sport as a, as, a, as a product. I mean, you'd, 
those people will still have the choice of the same sport. If you weren't, if you weren't there in, in BT Sport, your customers would still have the same choice of BT produced television, I mean, coming down the, down the line or coming through the satellite. It, would, it wouldn't affect the choice between the two platforms, would it? Because they're, they're both offering the same... It's, it's not quite as, as simple as that. Uh, our good friends at Sky would not give us access to sport, so we needed to create some negotiating chips, and that's one of and the reasons. And that's what it is. Yeah. So ultimately, we created BT Sport. Um, because you couldn't have done any television if you we hadn't need... got some killer app, Correct. and that killer app was sport. Yeah. It's quite, it's, it's, it's quite an expensive and time-consuming thing for, 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 for that, isn't it? Or, I mean, have you, have you costed it? Is it paying off? Is it working? It is paying off. Um, and the, the costs are high, there's no question about it, and uh, it's not for the faint-hearted, but relative to the money that we've invested in the network itself, it's actually relatively it's, small. It's, it's relatively small. Okay, well, so, so you didn't quite answer my question as to what the synergy is. You said, you, you, I, I understood your answer, which was, it's all about networks and getting people to use those networks as much as possible. Um, let's take the open reach one. Obviously, there's been an extensive debate about whether open reach, which is the uh, sort of wholesale provider to other to your competitors, um, open reach is being put at arm's <coughs> being put at arm's length effectively yeah. by regulators. What benefit is there now once you've got it that far away? What benefit is there to having it in the group as opposed to just saying to the shareholders, hey, there's a share slip, split, you can have open reach of BT shares and you're as well off as you always were and, and the world is happy and, the, and Ofcom can lay off about 30 people because we don't need to regulate it quite as toughly because it isn't part of BT group. Ultimately, um, as you say, open reach is completely regulated. 95, 96% of its revenues... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Are uh, dictated by regulation. Effectively, they're controlled by Ofcom in that respect. Uh, it has to serve uh, all its customers, both internal and external, and there are about 500 of them, uh, on exactly the same basis. So it does beg the question: What do you get as, as part of the group? I'd almost put it the other way around, which is there is nothing. Benefit. There's no benefit from spinning it out. It, it creates, in many ways, it's like the Brexit debate. It creates huge uncertainty. But at the other, other end of this, open reach will be a, if you were to spin it out, it would be a smaller, more vulnerable company uh, that would still be completely regulated. So ultimately, it would be, the, the cost would be would higher it have to be? because... because, it, because it, my perception was that it was... It, it would obviously have to be regulated because it would be a monopoly of that legacy system, legacy last mile system. In spite of the three billion we've spent on it, I don't consider that a legacy. No, no, no but I, okay, but I mean, it would be a, the, the, the kind of the, the endowment, if you like, is a valuable one. So it would have a lot of monopoly power. It would undoubtedly have to be regulated. And the, the talk talks and the skies who complain about you would complain if you had an unregulated open reach out there just able to charge what it wanted. However, doesn't it have to be more regulated because it's part of a big competitor in the market than if there was complete separation? No. The no? regulation would apply exactly the same way. You think there'd be no less regulation if it was... No. If it was but it would also be very vulnerable. So we talked about the three billion we've, we've invested. The payback at an open reach level is 20 years. It would never have got out of the, the blocks in 2009. Question whether or not it would even get out of the blocks today. You can't, uh, so can't make investments saying... and bets like that if you've got a, a smaller company. Um, so whereas you're... if you've got okay. the strength of the, 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 the so wider what... group, you can afford to take a longer-term view. Right, so you're, 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 in a sense, you've, we've got to the answer. Your basic consent, contention is that the, the balance sheet muscle of, of a BT group... The balance sheet, the R&D that I talked about earlier, uh, these would all have to... Um, be recreated, and they would create a weaker unit that managed the local Why unit. do you think? I mean, because actually, if I'm talk talk, I want. Why am I wanting it separated? Because I, I, I should, I should have the same interest in investment in open reach as BT does. Uh, if what you say is right, is it that they just don't understand 
that these. I, I think it's. I have my own theories on this, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, share them the, 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 <laughs> this is a, it's a family audience, and I'm not sure we should be, and we're before the watershed, but uh, um, no, I think that's a question for them. Right, okay. Let's talk about, uh, because we don't have, I, I do want to open up to the floor uh, in five minutes. The, the link to mobile, EE, mm. and the takeover, which was really just finally sealed this year, and it's a big thing for you. Um, Part of this is, seems to be predicated on the quad play. The, the, the. Now, I absolutely buy, absolutely buy, because I observe my own behavior and those of people I know, the triple play, the broadband, the telly, and the, the telephone, the landline. How big is the quad play? How many people are buying their mobile through, with, with their package, their other package? Um, I think it's slightly misleading to think about it as quad play because you don't have to buy every single component. Um, but if you look at virtually every other market around the world, certainly across Europe, uh, the, the trend to buying mobile and fixed together is quite extensive. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so the UK is behind that. And one of the reasons it's behind that is until now, there hasn't been any, uh, anybody in the UK who's had both a fixed and, and wireless arm. Of course, BT used to. Uh, and then but they never sold. It was never sold t together. It was never. There was never an attempt. I mean, there might no. have been marketing stuff with your phone bill in those days when we got phone bills. But the, but there was never a kind of hey, you get. It's like there's never a dual fuel offer for the mm. mobile and the. But the, the, the heart of this is the thing that's changed over the last ten years is people used to use mobile phones for voice calls. Uh, in the same way they used to use landlines for voice, voice calls. But it's, everything is data these days. Uh, and the, the you know, data consumption is going up between 50 and 100% a year. Uh, and the, the only way you can keep up with that and, and keep it at a competitive price is to effectively build a single network uh, that, that is able to do both. Right. And so that, at the heart of a mobile network is a fixed network. And as we go through 3G to 4G to 5G, you bring the fixed part of the network closer and closer to the consumer. Right. Are you going to market EE products as a package with, to, to people who say, you know, buy, buy, buy your mobile with your landline, buy your mobile with your broadband? Is that, are we expecting to see that? Uh, we already uh, offer BT Mobile as part of a, a broadband package. And uh, having only launched it less than a year ago, we've got uh, over 300,000 customers doing that with very modest marketing today. So uh, I think you'll see, we're, as we've, we've already explained, we're going to keep both brands. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the Plusnet brand as well. So we're, maybe it's my marketing roots showing there. Uh, well, like, I was interested because I was going to come to the brand thing. Again, the questions over TV, open reach, and EE are, in, in a sense, all the same as what is the synergy with the, with the rest of the outfit. And it, 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 so it's interesting that, that you are keeping the same brand. So there's certainly... I should think a lot of consumers are not going to realise that EE is part of BT. Is, is there... A, I suppose I'm wondering what the synergy is there, actually. The, 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 the synergy comes from having a single network behind everything. Um, and, you know, BT is not a brand that covers the whole of the market. You know, we have a relatively small share versus any of the European uh, comparators. Uh, it's one of the benefits of competition, you mm. see. Mm. So... You know, allowing having three brands allows you to cover more of the market. Take us through the the integration process because there, there have been reports that you're going to have some kind of reorganisation, and I think it involves reconfiguring the global services bit of the business and taking some bits of that that are actually UK rather than global, and then putting the EE bits into there. Is this a? How would you describe the reorganisation that you're now going through with the EE integration? It's not a huge one. Um, what we wanted to do is to ensure that uh, as E was integrated into the business, we were able to uh, combine it for our uh, business customers and public sector cust uh, customers domestically and be able to offer the full suite of services and, and to do that in, in, in a way that really made sense to the customers themselves. We needed to bring a part of global services, which is largely domestic, corporate and public sector combine it with our business division and add EE uh, right. on 
fundamental. So you'd call it a tweak rather than a kind of fundamental restructuring? Uh, somewhere between a tweak and a change. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I'm going to ask the consumer question now, which is going to offend and, me. No, it's not <laughs> going to offend you. No, it's not. It's, it, the consumer question is, is, how do we get faster broadband speeds? Why aren't you bringing fiber into the home? And how quickly are you going to be able to deliver on the, if, the, if you like, the government's ambitions for rural, for rural broadband? Um, and I, I, I fear asking this, because I think I'm going to get a slew of statistics that will show <laughs> that Britain's broadband speeds are not too bad internationally. And I, I know... You've obviously done your research. No, no, I'm not I even know, going to bring I any of them up. I know that consumers are never persuaded by these statistics, but I, I sort of feel absolutely duty-bound to ask you. I mean, what is the story on, on, on particularly those two, fibre into the home as opposed to the... To the, the, the box and, and rural, rural connection? Uh, well, let's talk about five to the home versus five to the cabinet yeah, yeah. Uh, to start with. Um, I think this is the wrong debate. Uh, I don't think customers are interested in, in, in terminology like that. I think they, they're interested in the, uh, the outcome at the end of it. Um, and I think we've been able to demonstrate, as other providers around the world have, that technology advances so quickly that uh, you cannot fix uh, and say, well, fiber to the cabinet will never be able to provide the sort of speeds that you want. So to illustrate this, we launched fiber to the cabinet across the whole of the UK, or well, that was our preferred technology. Uh, so that's, that takes fiber to the cabinet and then the last hop, which is around 300 meters for most of the UK, or 300 meters or less, uh, over copper. When we launched, we got 40 megs through that. Um, within a year, we were able to get 80 megs through that. Uh, and we're about, um, hopefully, uh, very soon to announce uh, that we're going to upgrade that to initially 300, but ultimately 500 megabits per second. That is the same basic architecture. So to a customer, you're almost getting, well, getting over 10 times more for what will be a relatively small uh, change in the I'm price. Not get, I'm not getting these broadband speeds. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know, and I know why, because you're on cable. I am cable. on Virgin. I am on Virgin. <laughs> I am, but, but how quickly... How I've quickly, got a deal for you. <laughs> how, quickly, how quickly is it going to... Are, are consumers going to see these speeds go up then? Uh, well, this is, this is a, a relatively consumers. simple yeah. simple change. It's a change of a card. It's a software change in a, in a cabinet. You know, the cost of the network have all been about taking glass from the exchange to the cabinet. That's a major undertaking. And then bringing power to the cabinet itself, so getting electricity there. Because previously, didn't have it. Yeah, it, was going, it was just going yeah. across the copper. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That so the debate is, is the wrong one for me. If we'd have gone with fibre to the premise in the beginning, we'd have only got to 10% of the UK now and I would be getting beaten up for a different reason than the one that uh, I sometimes feel is I'm you couldn't beaten have done to. both. You couldn't have launched on a kind of fibre to premises in, in the, the, the high-value areas. And we, in reality, that's what we do anyway. We've got more fibre to the premises than anybody else in the UK, uh, but it's, it's small relative to the fibre to the cabinet coverage. But over I mean, time... We're talking tiny, though, aren't we? We're talking how, how, how many have got fibre to premises? Uh, it's about half a million, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So over time, it will change. It will go up. Um, but you know the demand is, you know, well, you can get four ultra HD uh, pictures over 50 meg, and um, or probably two over 50 meg. So, um, you, you know, it, you need to find ways to right, use right, that. Right. And it's got to be cost effective. Everybody. Yeah. So just a quick one on the because there's been huge criticism of BT in terms of the rural rollout, hasn't there? And the, the fact that they had a, what looked like a contest for contracts and basically BT just got them all. Um, it's always just about to be delivered, isn't it? It's never quite there, isn't it? Is, is that just my perception? You need to get out more. Um, <laughs> we haven't missed any uh, milestone along the way. And, and just to, to be really clear, there were 44 contracts. Yeah. Yes, we won them all. Believe me, <laughs> we did not want to win some of them. They're extremely challenging to, de to deliver. Right. We have to invest at the same time. It's not just, this isn't just a handout. 
And our slice of the investment is still a 15-year payback. So this is not a license to print money, uh, I can assure you. And if you're trying to hook up islands around the whole of the UK, for example, that is no small undertaking. So we've hit every milestone. We'll deliver 95% of the UK by the end of 2017. And we have found ways of going beyond that um, if, if the government really wants to do that. I'm going, to, I'm going to open up. I'll ask one more question, so just be ready with your own um, questions. Just in terms of your background as a marketing guy coming in, what, how hard was it for you to adjust to a kind of a company that had big R&D, quite a technical bent, a sort of network company, and how much of your job do you think is about communicating the company, selling the company? Uh, well, I'm an engineer by education, uh, and I was, my first job was working for ICI. I was a sponsored student. Um, so I've, I've got a, a strong technical basis right. to start with. Uh, I then learned how to run a business and a brand, uh, a p and um, Hacker. Funnily <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, um, so I made a lot of hair care commercials in my life. Uh, and then I switched. I worked uh, in Cable. Yeah, yeah, Telus became yeah. Virgin Media and then came to BT 12 years ago. So it wasn't that big a transition. And in many ways, BT and P&G are more similar than certainly Telewest in those days, which was um, a feast to famine existence. Uh, it was that there was more uh, a change going from Telewest to, to BT or and You don't or find the kind of techie people trying to talk slowly and in a patronizing way to you at BT and- uh, No, because I, I always start with, I'm an engineer and they get very excited. And then they, then they think- Because I'm the first engineer that's been the CEO.